like last time we recorded, I was in Italy. This time I'm in my office and it's in shambles. So, <laughs> you know, like with the electrical problem I've had, because I was, uh, I start, what was I? Oh, I was looking for my microphone. And I was like, oh, that's right. I took everything off my shelves and now it's on the floor. Mm-hmm. In, in, in this, you know, and you've been in here. It's a tiny space, but I was still like, I have no idea where my microphone was. And I found it and it's fine, but it's just, it's funny. It's a funny time. So I want to tell you what I'm doing right now. Okay. I am going through my treasure box. Mm-hmm. I, I, I have a, a, a dusty little treasure chest that I keep some of my tr- childhood treasures in. And I had picked it up and, and, and dusted it off. And so you open it up and it's got like like leather pouches that I and, and felt pouches that I sewed together. Mm-hmm. And uh, and it's it's very much like it's very much reminding me of uh, what I thought was cool and fantasy like when I was very young, uh-huh. which is which is really fun. And I've added to it through the years, um, but I, w- I have found a bunch of old uh, coins that I collected and I was thinking like I have a few of these. Like, I don't know if you have any more than just the Ewok coin. Mm-hmm. But I have uh, a Renaissance Festival token. This has a crown that says Sovereign on one side, and on the other side it says Renaissance Festival 1984 with a wizard. Wow! So you can choose wizard or crown. Wow. I have I have a couple Aladdin's. Do you remember Aladdin's castle? Uh huh. I have a couple Aladdin's castle tokens. Wow. So you've got one with the. Um, I think we definitely need to move over to the Renaissance Fair coin. I, I, I feel like it's a pretty. I feel like wizard or crown is a pretty is a pretty good coin. Yeah. Um, and I have this really weird. What I've had this. I don't remember not having this coin ever, but it's big. It looks like it looks like I, I've never actually seen what these things that people call challenge coins, but it looks like what I imagine a challenge coin looks like. Mm-hmm. And it's got this guy on a sil- um, like a silhouette of this like cartoon looking guy with a big baseball cap and a nose that looks like a like like literally like it's a bowling pin. <laughs> and it says, "Now I've had this coin. Okay, I've had this coin. I don't remember not having owning this coin. It says Falstaff. That's my beer." <laughs> and then the guy and underneath the guy it says "Old Pro," and then it says, "Oh, I can't. I'm I'm getting too old to even read this." Let me put on my. I'm actually going to put on my reading glasses to get this tiny type. You, you cheetahs. Yeah, is this Chicago Bears? Oh, it's a Bears Cardinals game thing. Okay, this is that old. Oh, Forty Niners Bears. Bears cards, Colts Forty Niners Steelers Bears Colts Rams with dates. Okay, so this is. Uh, oh my gosh. Okay, it says Chicago Bears Cardinals. 59 fall staff telecast schedule. So wow. this, this coin is from 1959. That's cool. Okay. Wow. I feel like it's something my grandpa gave me. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But you know, I can't swear that. Anyway, uh, so I guess for today we will we will go with uh, wizard or crown. Yeah, I like that. Um, I'm glad all of this was being recorded. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, you know, you, I just... So here's the thing, though, when I was a kid, I had so the gas station was giving away um, like every time you filled up, you would get um, like a gold coin with a president on it, like a presidential coin. And so my dad had a ton of them because, like I said, it was one of those things where it's like every time you filled up, they gave you one. Yeah. So I would take them because they looked like the gold coins that um, like prince john is 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 yeah. counting or, you put or them Sir in a little Hiss bag yeah and like and i would do that like i would stack them and i would i would lift them and drop them all down you know like scrooge yeah yeah oh i know i get it yeah and so i used to take those like you were saying and i also had a leather marble bag mm-hmm. and i dumped the marbles out and i would put the coins in there because then it it felt like you know my my robin hood satchel or whatever yeah yeah and uh yeah so i would i would do that and i would go out into the woods and i would i would make rations for myself yes 
Like I would, it, w- it was usually like Cheez-Its and like leftover cold chicken wrapped in a paper towel and tied with twine. <laughs> yes, I get, yes, I am so there with this. I, mm-hmm. I know exactly what you're doing and I know exactly the feeling uh, that you get when you try to put these things together. And it's funny how like, um, I just, it's just so weird, particularly watching Ronia do some of these same things like mm-hmm. for Ronia, it's potions. Any little bottle that she can get a hold of, she will uh, fill up with water, try to co- like and put food coloring in it for different colors and cork it. So like she's so so she ended up with this this table full of um, her potions. And it mm-hmm. was just it's just really cute because like they have to be a wide and varied set of of interesting little bottles yeah it's really really fun and i'm glad your kids get to get to do that because i feel like that's something that a lot of kids don't get to do anymore because like i when i was growing up i grew up in a house and there was wood there was just the woods behind my house and i used to go out there all the time and um and there was never i mean i know there's like a lot of talk now about this kind of thing but like there was never like I don't know. I just went out there. I mean, I probably told my mom, like, I'm going outside. Yeah. Or I'm going into the woods. But, like, that was it. There was not any – I didn't have a watch. <laughs> you right. know, it wasn't like, oh, <laughs> yeah. i got to be back at 3.30. You know, I just yeah. went out there. And it's not like my parents ever freaked out or anything. Yeah. Um, and, you know, that's that's funny. Like, I don't remember really having a watch either. And I do remember, like, running out to – play and it's like be back for dinner you know and then how did i how did we know when dinner was do you just feel it in your bones maybe it's it, maybe it's instinctual like how birds know where to migrate it must be it i, I don't know because I, re- I really can't remember how i would have known what time it was running yeah, around the no, neighborhood same, like i did same here and of course you realize too, like kid logic, it probably felt like you were in the woods all day, but you were probably right. out there about 20 minutes. Right, right, right. Yeah, I mean, there's also that. There's also that. But I also feel like like if I told the girls like, oh, no, then you, this, go out and do your thing, but be back for dinner. Yeah. Like I would probably be a little bit like if I was getting dinner later, I'd be like, uh, where are they? You know, like mm-hmm. and not even not even sometimes just for reasons of like, I want the the Brussels sprouts to be just right you know, served and eaten like Mm -hmm. like that, like dinner. It's important. Uh, I don't know. Anyway. I don't know the time times we lived in. Yeah. It's, it's, it's really weird. Like, uh, there, there has been a shift. I feel like just in the past, like five years or so where I've, I've started to think like, Oh, that was a different time. Like I'll see photographs or watch an old show from that time and be like, okay, it was just, you know, like a long time ago, but now it's like feels like a different time. Like how I felt about like, I don't know, like the 60s or 50s or something. You know, something else that sort of sticks out to me is like, you know, we grew up in the stranger danger thing, right? Like, yeah. Yeah, like if if you did not know who someone was, they were a threat. That was yeah. basically what we were taught. But we were also taught how to deal with that so like it it was never like kids don't go outside or kids don't do you know don't right. do these things or you know make sure there's always a parent with you like that was never that was not ever the thing no the, the thing, thing was always like yeah. go do your thing but if you know somebody drives up to you and says hey you know my dog's missing can you come help me find it you know, like how to deal with that. And so, right, right. I don't know. I feel like that. Yeah, we had like, I feel like I even had that little movie in my head of somebody drives up. Mm-hmm. They roll the window down. They're like, hey, can you come over here and talk for a minute? Yeah. And like, and like, you, and you're like, your mom oh, I, told me to come pick you up. Yeah, yeah. And then you've got this like script of what you're supposed to do. Like, I, I remember like there was a thing about like never wear a shirt that has your name on it. Oh, <laughs> I never heard that. That's good. Yeah, because then someone, you know, someone pulls up and is like, hey, Kevin, yeah. your mom said that I should pick you up, you know, like and it then, just wear a shirt with somebody else's name on it. And if they right. say it, if they're like, hey, Daniel, you're like jokes on you. Yeah, my name's Ben. And you run away into the hey, woods. <laughs> that is not you know what? That is not a bad tactic. Yeah. <laughs> hey, Adidas. <laughs> 
Hey, Nikkei. Yeah, hey, Nikkei. <laughs> and you're like, joke's on you, creepo. And you run. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a Reebok kid. <laughs> Oh gosh! <laughs> and you run into the woods, where yeah. you'll meet wood spirits. What a segue! I can I get the segue trophy this time? Ben, we've got like all of these. We've got sleeping bags. We've got tents. We're going. What are we doing? We are going to camp out in the woods, and it's going to be fun and maybe a little spooky. Ooh. And we're going to uh, uh, see what we can see out there, and we're going to talk about all the creatures that you might meet um in your if, if you're under the canopy of leaves well that's great because i've got a few woodland creatures that we need to keep an eye out for and um a couple of them are actually pretty dangerous so but i think again just just like we were saying you know knowledge is power as long as we know about these things i think we'll be okay Yep. If if one if one of these woodland creatures says, "Hey, hey, Daniel." Hey, Daniel. Uh, <laughs> hey, okay. There's but we no also Daniel. have to decide who's going first, and I'm so glad that we have uh, we have a trial coin. So yeah. So we have a new coin. Yes. This is something I picked up at, at, at I think a Renaissance. Well, it says Ren- Renaissance Festival 1984. So this is a this is a coin that I've had for many many years. Um, and on one side it has a wizard. And a bunch of stars, magic stars. And on the other side, it has a crown. So so we're going to go back into all the episodes and we're going to edit out the Ewok coin and <laughs> put in the wizard and crown coin. No, we are not. We're going to let people <laughs> appreciate the, the evolution of the idea. That's true. Because um, I, I think the Ewok coin has a, a lot of charm as well. Mm-hmm. So, But I, 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 I love this coin that you have. So... Uh, I love to be reunited, and I, I I love the idea of childhood Ben squirreling this away and never knowing that it was going to be used for something. Because he said, "Someday I'll have a podcast where I have to flip a coin." <laughs> like, and the, my parents are like, "You and your podcasts? What even is a podcast?" Yep, yep. <laughs> Makes up these words. What is that? A Nintendo? <laughs> what is that? One of your Nintendos? <laughs> Oh man. Okay, here we go. You're gonna call out coin or wi- uh, crown or wizard. Ready? Okay. One, two, three. Wizard. It is crown. I'm afraid. All right. So that means I choose who goes first. Yes. And Zach, I choose you. Oh, I feel like a Pokemon. Well, as well you should. I'm gonna start with uh, one that I don't think that a lot of us have heard of. Um, And this is actually a creature that is pretty ubiquitous um, in, in the area where I live in Massachusetts. Um, But it's, it's known throughout sort of the uh, Eastern seaboard. When you look it up, a lot of places say that it sort of originates down in Delaware, um, but certainly all the way up into new England. And this is, can I just ask, so this is in the realm of local lore. It's pretty, yeah, I would say it's fairly, fairly local. I love this already. But this is the Pukwudgie. Now, the Pukwudgie actually comes from Wampanoag folklore. So here, like I said, where I am in eastern Massachusetts, um, most of the indigenous land is, is Wampanoag. Uh, okay. Wampanoag land. In fact, the word Pukwudgie is actually a rough translation uh, that means little wild man of the woods that vanishes. Oh, sweet. So a Pukwudgie, if you were if we were to see one, we might mistake it for a porcupine at first. So it's about two to three feet tall. It often is up in the trees. And from the back, it like I said, it can be mistaken for a porcupine. Whether it has actual quills or just sort of like long hair is sort of not known. Um, but if it turns around, we'll see that it actually looks like a little humanoid troll kind of creature. Pukwudgie is not actually something that we should mess with. Okay. So uh, they're pretty hostile to humans. Um, and, you know... We talked like we talked about in our house spirit episode, um, 
certain house spirits that can be sort of like, you know, cause mischief and things like that. Mm -hmm. The puck wedgie can cause mischief, but it's actually usually much more dangerous than that. Um, It often uses poison arrows. Uh, It can start fires. Oh, man. Yeah. And and there are tales of a puck wedgies actually pushing people off of cliffs (laughs) and things like that. Horrible. Yeah. So so not sort of like a a friendly or or mischievous forest creature the puckwedgie um it's said that uh in in wampanoag folklore uh that puckwedgies actually used to be really friendly towards people towards humans um but there is a figure in wampanoag folklore named mashop who's like this big friendly giant and the people uh, really kind of revere Moshop, and the Puckwudgies became jealous of that. And so that's when they started kind of taking their frustrations out on, on humans and, and, and people. Now, one of the things that is interesting about the Puckwudgie is while it's part of Wampanoag folklore, it has kind of stepped into the realm of a cryptid as well oh because there are people even to this day who who claim that they have seen or had encounters with puckwudgies now puckwudgies like so many of these creatures are also shape changers Mm -hmm. and uh so there are lots of stories about people out in the woods particularly places like the freetown state forest who have talked about encountering um, glowing orbs, not unlike the Will-O-Wisp, and the orb kind of going around them and them following the orb into the woods, only for the orb to turn into one of these little creatures and run away, and the person is like, you know, lost or or at the edge of the cliff or, or, or something like that. So they like to lure people into dangerous dangerous situations man i love all the overlap and i'm like i'm a huge sucker for uh, like older lore that has that that resurfaces in in modern stories so this one has had everything so far (laughs) so i actually found in 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 looking stuff up that the freetown state forest which is in in close to my area um in 2017, as an April Fool's joke, actually put up Puckwudgie Crossing signs. Oh, so it's well known enough that Puckwudgie Crossing signs would be noticed and, and appreciated. Right. That's right. cool. And, you know, they sort of like, you, you know, they're often found in these areas where there are other kind of dark things yeah. that may happen. For example, the Freetown State Forest is is legit known for um criminal and cult activity okay. particularly through the 70s and the 80s this is well documented okay. and um and so kind of the overlap of that kind of dark energy with puckwudgies is something you you see a lot cool yeah and so again it's it's you know we've talked about like overlap and and stuff and you know and again here's another example of something from a a culture different from a Western European culture, right? Mm-hmm. But still has the idea of this small, ugly creature who, uh, you know, is is goblin-like or troll-like or, you know, kind of all these things and is dangerous to people. And so, yeah. you know, it's like what what in the human subconscious creates that or what, you know, of course, we we talk about how people always go to the, well, does that mean that these are real or that there's some precedent that, you know, different people in disparate cultures have similar things? And my answer is, I don't know. Well, my Um, answer is everybody, we are all people and we all have a relationship. Like the person to forest relationship is, you know, mm cross-cultural, more or less. mm -hmm. I mean, obviously, yeah, there's, there's desert cultures and things like this, but but I think like human to, to forest is, is, is a, is a relationship that, that is, is wide and varied. And it's, it's, it makes sense that a lot of the same um, themes and ideas would, would resurface. 
Yeah. Um, and I feel like that a lot of this plugs into some of the stuff that I've been uh, uh, looking at this past week as I prepared. So this mm. is great. <laughs> so that is the puck wedgie. I like it. I like it a lot. And I'm very excited to see the, uh, the illustration for this one. All right. So I, uh, when we started talking about this, um, I think we had um, mentioned dryads. Mm-hmm. And I wanted to start out with, uh, to me, when you say forest spirit, um, it's maybe the, the baseline that I think of. I go down and I think, ah, dryads and hamadryads, wood nymphs, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and wood nymphs are, so obviously this is, this is the Greek mythology. Um, they are um, female spirits of the forest, uh, spirits of the natural world. Uh, sort of like minor goddesses. But um, what was interesting to me uh, once I started reading is, uh, and, it's, and, and I feel like has always been a little bit interesting to me, is um, <laughs> how many of them there are and how many different kinds there are. Mm. Um, so, and, and also how nymphs are, are different and odd and strange and different from, from the gods. Uh, what's um, actually over the summer I read... Um, uh, Circe, uh, but I think I, I mentioned that in one of the past podcasts. I think so. Um, it's by uh, Madeline Miller, right? So, um, and there were, you know, there's nymphs in that, and and she makes the same point uh, that unlike the gods, uh, mo- uh, you know, in most stories, nymphs can be killed or, or can die, so they end up being um, sort of like what we'd call functionally immortal. Mm-hmm. Uh, in many cases, right, like like a river nymph could be functionally more live forever, but like in stories, uh, they're you know can be killed, but if not, they'll just keep on living. And so they're caretakers of forests and springs and meadows. Um, they're all, also um, uh, described as the companions of Dionysus, uh, the god of wine, or Bacchus in, in the Roman myths. Um, and so. What ended up when I started reading was that the lists of these, um, and and like we've talked a lot about like the the mythological mind living in a sort of enchanted world, and we just think oh dryad is a is a tri-, but that's like a, a an overarching term for all of these different ones. So they have the and this is going to be the fun part where I try to read these uh, Greek nymph type names and we will laugh at how poorly i do so wait just real quick before you do that so yeah is a dryad a nymph a dryad is a type of nymph yes okay so, so all dryad, dryads are nymphs but not all nymphs are dryads. right so um okay. it's it's uh yeah so these are uh, dryads are specifically tree uh or forest nymphs mm-hmm. um not like water spirits or or uh, or yeah or yads or or whatever but then we have um, among the dryads, we have the melee for ash trees, mm-hmm. and they are specifically interesting because they are um, uh, so ash trees tend tend also for some reason to be uh, tied into creation uh, the cre- creation myths for for humans and specifically. Oh right, right. So the melee are, are are the nymphs of ash trees, and they were born uh, from from Gaia. When uh, she was impregnated by the blood of uh, the castrated um, Oranos, or Ura- basically Uranus, right? Mm. They and they were um, they were so these these nymphs were wed by men of the Silver Age at the time before the first woman was created, and from them, from these, from that those pairings, mankind descends or is born, or humankind is born. Interesting. So, so those dryads specifically are tied in with the uh, creation myth of humans. Then there's the oread, oreades, oreadio, uh, the mount, for mountain conifers like pines, and these mm. are uh, these are the particular dryads that hang out with the satyrs mm. or satyrs. The hamadryads are for oaks and poplars. The meliades are for apple trees or fruit trees, and what's Weird about that. Uh, so they're the Meliades, and they also protect sheep. Uh, okay. And then I found out that Melas, the, the root word for this Meliades, is a word that 
uh, is both apple and sheep, apparently. <laughs> Any native Greek speakers out there? Yes, yeah, so you can School correct us. us. <laughs> yes. There's the <laughs> Daphne uh, for laurel trees. There's the Aegeroi for black poplars. Ampelleroi for grape vines, which sounds a little bit like amphora, which are those big uh, jars made to carry wine. Mm. The Carrier for hazelnuts. The Oh, this is a tough one. It's K-R-A-N-E-I-A-I. Craniae for cherry trees. This is this is going to be so embarrassing. <laughs> uh, the Moriae for mulberries, the Teliae for elm, and the Sky for fig. Um, so there's a lot of these different ones. I already want to see a, like a poster where it, there's like a picture of like you know those like posters or those illustrations that show you like the tree and the leaf to identify i already want to see yes. one like that but it also shows the dryad so you're going to have to draw every single one of these dryads and make them distinct and unique to their tree i i, I am sorely tempted to do that because <laughs> um if you think back i want to see if your experience with dryads is similar to mine what's the first thing you remember reading with dryads in it um it's a trick question because i know what you want me to say okay fine <laughs> <laughs> that, well, it makes it more interesting if you've got something different. Go for you it. You want me to say the line, the witch in the wardrobe? Um, yeah, or Prince Caspian. Yeah, basically. Okay. C.S. Lewis. All right. Narnia. Yeah. Um, and so that's a very early one for sure. But um, to be honest, I don't know because it probably would have been around the same time. So when I was really young, my grandmother gave me uh, Dialer's book of Greek myths and I oh, just okay. devoured that book. Sure. So I knew about dryads from that. But like I said, honestly, thinking back on it, I can't remember which would have come first. It was either one of those. Okay. 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 So for me, it was definitely Narnia. And I loved C.S. Lewis's. I actually looked up one of these because we were talking about these illustrations for the, for the different uh, dryads. Mm -hmm. And he was, and that's where I think my first idea of these being different spirits for different trees came out. Mm. Let's see. So all around Lucy, she saw it was a crowd of human shapes. Pale birch girls were tossing their heads. Willow women pushed back their hair from their brooding faces to gaze on Aslan. The queenly beeches stood still and adored him. Shaggy oak men, lean and melancholy elms, shock-headed hollies. Gay rowans all bowed and rose again, shouting Aslan, Aslan in their various husky or creaking or wave-like voices. So that was the first one where I like I remember reading that and thinking how different all these different types of, of tree creatures were. Yeah. But the other thing that I found in Prince Caspian was that he mentions dryads and hamadryads. And mm -hmm. all my life, I never really knew or sadly thought to ask what was the difference between a dryad and a hamadryad right same i mean you know it's almost like you think one is just maybe like bigger than the other right or like a goblin and a hobgoblin right yeah <laughs> but there's a key difference mm. and the one the key difference is a dryad is uh like we were saying uh, like like a functionally immortal uh wood spirit mm -hmm. uh the hamadryad is born with their tree tied to their tree all their life and dies when the tree dies oh. or is cut down. So the, the hamadryads are sort of sub spirits in a way or, 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 or sub creatures in a way that they, they have this limited lifespan that is very, they very much are the tree and they're described as like, like if you chop down this tree, like, like they will cry out when the first cut is made, mm. um, which, and, and like, they are pictured as sort of like, are they like part, um, like literally part of the tree? Like yeah, I feel well, like, like in I, some depictions, like you see dryads that are sort of like literally the tree. Yes. And then yes, versus that's it. like a woman, a tree like woman that's a sort tree like of woman among who's got the legs tree. and walks around. Right. Yeah. And then the hamadryads are sort of like human from the waist up and then go down into roots into the ground. Gotcha. Um, so that is the difference between, between uh, dryads and hamadryads. Which I was, um, I'm glad I learned. See, now uh, here's another opportunity for art. I want to see like a poster 
that or like a sign that would be in in the park that we are um, camping in that says like hmm. know the difference. <laughs> <laughs> Yes. Like this tree is okay to get wood from, but this one's not. Yeah, yeah, that'd be that'd be awesome. But it's like yeah, anyway. So but I I always like I'm comforted by by the the thought of dryads and wood nymphs, even though they're sort of ethereal. So with the Pukwudgie, I wanted to keep the flashlight on. I was a little nervous. Yeah. But mm-hmm. I feel I feel that um I've always felt that the dryads were sort of a wild but comforting presence. All right, so my second one is uh, I, I, I'm still sticking to the realm of um, I hesitate to say earthly or or real world, but I can't think of a better a better one. So I want to talk about the Sasquatch, aka oh, I've been waiting for this one, Bigfoot. So Sasquatch, Bigfoot is I would say clearly a a cryptid, meaning um, a potentially real animal versus, say, like, you know, a, a, a fairy tale creature. Although, depending on who you talk to. Um, but uh, all right. So but anyways, before we get into that. <laughs> <laughs> no, you are you are free. to. This is a safe place, Zach. You are free to geek out. I know this is one of your favorite subjects. Well, I mean, I will, I will, I will state right now. I don't care who knows it. Uh, I'm, I'm totally a believer uh, of Bigfoot. I think Bigfoot is. I think Sasquatches are real. I think they're out there. Um, and do you do you have a hat or a shirt that says "Gone Squatching," or is that just my imagination? Unfortunately, that's just your imagination. Okay, I, okay. I don't Sorry. have one. I it's. I think I just imagine you that way. I mean. It's or maybe now I know it's I know it's coming for Christmas. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So first, let's describe what uh, Sasquatch looks like. So Sasquatch or Bigfoot has been described as being anywhere between eight and ten feet tall. Uh, it is ape-like, um, usually with like a very large kind of conical skull and uh, brown dark brown to black uh, or even red fur, like an orangutan. There's a lot of sightings that describe red fur. Um, there have also been sightings that talk about silver or white fur, like a potentially older one. Ooh. And honestly, based on on descriptions and and some of the more credible sightings and, and descriptions, I actually feel like in popular culture, a really close, probably one of the closest examples is probably Harry from Harry and the Hendersons. Like, uh, I think that is actually probably pretty close to what they actually look like. That's, I was going to ask, I had that in mind as something to ask you. That's great. Yeah. Um, so also they are identified, in addition to sightings, they've also been identified obviously by their footprints. Um, howls and calls and vocalizations where uh, people have made recordings um and 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 things like that uh they've been known to like bang sticks on trees and throw rocks at people things like that and also a a pungent smell that in one report i saw uh was described as imagine a skunk had rolled around in dead animals Wow. So, yeah, so they, they smell they smell pretty bad. Um, OK, so 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 past the description. <laughs> so let's talk about is is Bigfoot real? Is Bigfoot a myth? Um, like I said, uh, yeah, I, I'm a believer. I think that Bigfoot is out there. I think Bigfoot is um, a very rare very intelligent, very elusive ape. Some things, I think some things to keep in mind. An example I like to talk about is the gorilla. Um, People knew about gorillas. People, there were like legends about gorillas. The first gorilla was not actually sighted by white Westerners until 1857. So that Mm. was like, that was the first time that somebody from the West, somebody not in the Congo, 
could confirm that that gorillas were real. Okay. And the entire Congo, not just like the rainforest area, but the entire thing is like 900,000 square feet. And mm-hmm. so you, it's not like that big. And you think about, you know, any of us who have ever been out in the woods, particularly in like the Pacific Northwest or or any of these places, you don't have to go far before it's like, you realize how vast and dense the forest is. You know, when people say like, well, why don't people just go out there and find Bigfoot if it's real? It's like, well, it's, it's a big area, you know? I mean, it, it it really, it really is. There are approximately only recorded uh, about 10,000 recorded sightings in, in North America. So we associate Bigfoot a lot with like the Pacific Northwest, but there have been sightings throughout the entire country and certainly up in Canada uh, and, and you know, just all over, all over North America. Now the Sasquatch is different from the Yeti. So sometimes people say like, Oh, Sasquatch, Bigfoot, Yeti. It's the same thing. They're not. Um, But Sasquatch and Bigfoot. Yes. Sasquatch. Right. Yes. Okay. So uh, Sasquatch. So I'd mentioned that Pukwudgie was sort of a, a, a translation of a Wampanoag word. Sasquatch is the same thing. It's an anglicized version of the word Sasquets, okay, uh, which which means hairy men. In in lots of indigenous folklore, there are tales of large hairy men in in the woods. And something that I found really interesting is that there is a sacred site called Painted Rock in California, and this this is a sacred site to the Yokuts people. And this rock is estimated to be somewhere between 500 and 1,000 years old, but there there are paintings on it. Oh, neat. And there are paintings that I think can reasonably be described as a Sasquatch. So, like, because, like, there's humans and there's Sasquatches, and it's sort of like, and there's other, like, real-life animals. And so a lot of the... A lot of the speculation is like, well, why would they paint all these real animals and people? Uh-huh. Yeah. <laughs> but then have a mythological creature there. Hmm. But anyways, like I said, it's like this this sacred site. And even like the pictures, the painting is very you have to you have to decipher it a little bit because sure. it's obviously very old. In addition to that, Teddy Roosevelt. <gasps> this just got real. So he did not himself have a sighting, at least not one that is recorded. Okay. But we know Teddy Roosevelt was, you know, sort of like the big game hunter. Yeah. And he wrote a book about a lot of his his stories. And in that book is a story that was recounted to him, uh, a story from an old trapper who basically described a Bigfoot. And, and Teddy Roosevelt even says, you know, in the book, in writing this story, he doesn't sort of say like, you know, oh, the guy was crazy or anything like that. All he says was that like when the guy was telling him this amazing story that the guy seemed shaken, he seemed, yeah, you know, frightened by it. So, I mean, if you can't, you know, if you can't trust Teddy Roosevelt. <laughs> <laughs> this is great. Um, so Bigfoot. So the term Bigfoot was used off and on throughout throughout history. Um, but it really sort of took hold in 1958. So 1958 okay. is when a man named Jerry crew, who was a, I think he was some sort of excavator or worked on a bulldozer. I don't know. Um, he created one of the first plaster casts of he, he, he made this plaster cast of these prints that he had found on the work site of this 16 inch human like footprint. And so that's really that's kind of the flashpoint where Bigfoot really enters sort of like the modern consciousness of America and Jeez. pop culture. Okay. The other most famous piece of evidence that we've all seen is the Patterson Gimlin film. Yes. So that's from 1967. And this is for those who don't know what I'm talking about. I can play it you, in my mind. You do know. You yeah. do know what I'm talking about. <laughs> this is the famous film of a Bigfoot, wa- a female Bigfoot walking through the, the woods or it's through like a little, I don't know, estuary or something. Yeah. 
and it turns and looks at the camera and continues walking. And that frame where the Bigfoot is turned and looking at the camera has become like the icon. Like when mm-hmm. you see pictures of Bigfoot or like on gone squatching shirts yeah. or Bigfoot crossing signs or whatever, that silhouette is, is the frame from that film. Now people have analyzed that film since 1967. This is part of why I believe Bigfoot is real. <laughs> Okay. Because there are certain pieces of evidence where, for example, this film, where it becomes more complicated to explain why it's a hoax than just attributing it to Bigfoot. You know, this includes things like hair that has been found way up high in in tree branches Mm. that can't be identified. And it's like, why would somebody just put a batch of hair up there. Um, But this video, like I said, has been analyzed. And the problem is, is like a lot of people will come out and say, well, it's a man in a monkey suit. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of stuff about why it's not a man in a monkey suit. One of the things is remembering that it's 1967. Where did they get the suit? Because it's if it's a suit, it's not a a rental gorilla suit. If you look at it, right? right? Like it doesn't f- it the f- it doesn't have fabric where the folds move the way a costume would. Um, it's it would be like a Hollywood level costume, and it seems unlikely that these guys would be able to create that. And there's other, I mean, like people have t- taken really deep dives, you know, measuring the arms and and the gait, and they've gone out there to see like how big it would actually have to be. And, you know, it's it's just, it's, it's really fascinating. Now, the other thing is people will point out, oh, well, so-and-so came out and said that they were, like they've had people, they've had like this guy take a lie detector test saying that he was the guy in that costume. As I've heard, yes. Problem is, there are many people who have come out and said Ah. that they were the guy in that costume. Okay. Because you'd want to be the guy. You'd want to be the person who said, hey. Right. That was me all along. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Now, the two guys, I can't remember. One of them died in, I think, like the mid-70s. Okay. And then the other one is actually still alive. Um, But neither one of them have ever changed their story about what what that film was. Hmm. Hmm. And so, uh, yeah, it's also one of those things where it's like, the more you look at it, I feel the more real it becomes. Part of it is just like how smoothly the creature moves through this obviously rocky terrain. Yeah. And a person, particularly a person in a suit would just not be able to do that. Yeah. Yeah. So that's my, uh, that's my bite sized take on Sasquatch. (laughs) Brilliant. (laughs) And it's a haunting uh, piece of footage that 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 um, what's it called again? Patterson Gimlin. Yeah, the film. Patterson Gimlin. It's like, it is like it's it, there's it is just iconic and haunting. And I will remain the Scully to your molder. Uh, okay. For this one, but like mm-hmm. Scully, I am uh, very happy to go on this journey of discovery. Mm-hmm. I would love to go squatching. Me too. That that would be that would be great. Although I just. Yeah, I don't I don't know. I don't know what would happen if I ever saw one. Two books here on my desk. Um and one is a, a little problematic because I can't remember if I've I'm going to have to have have you remind me if I've talked about this book before. Have I gone into Stephen Fry's Mythos? We've talked about it as a off off the air. Okay, but not but I don't think you've talked about it on the show. Okay, it's not been one of my, Okay. Well, that's good because uh because we're doing because we did dryads. <laughs> I will say I pulled none of my dryad information from this book, mm-hmm. but it is a book of of Greek mythology um uh, by the the just tr- wonderful Stephen Fry, the the world treasure Stephen Fry. He's put together this excellent book uh called Mythos the Greek myths reimagined and they're not really re I wouldn't say they're reimagined. It's, um, it's retold retold or told in his charming voice. I would say, um, I, I would, I, I've heard people, I, and if you love his, his actual voice voice, I, I, I imagine that this is a, 
marvelous audio book. Mm-hmm. But I will say that the the physical book, the hardcover that I have here, is is just a, a beautifully printed um, uh, thing uh, with beautiful gold, or actually it looks more like copper leaf on its illustration on the front, um, just really nicely put around, put together. It's got uh, a beautiful map of the Mediterranean area, the world of the Greek myths. And then he, uh, you learn so much about uh, how these myths have, you know, worked their way into our modern language and the way we talk. Um, so it's just, it's just a wonderful book. And it's a book that um, is, you know, the Greek myths at their heart are <sighs> difficult for what we would, in our modern sensibilities, consider all ages fair, right? So sure, he, yeah. he does a good, a pretty good job of, you know, uh, bringing it to all ages. Uh, I'd be happy to hand this to any any of my kids. It's got a beautiful art throughout. It retells everything uh, just very, very nicely, and it feels like you're at once. Um, current and at the same time diving into into that world you you said you you uh instead of c.s lewis you had read um was it edith hamilton's mythology which one was it uh the dollars okay dollars yeah and like we remember i i remember yeah i remember the edith hamilton growing up this is just extremely approachable i i just really like it um so and you know talk, like sisyphean tasks right where did that come from in, in t- retelling the myth of Sisyphus, <laughs> Sisyphus. and it's just mm-hmm. just a really good book i really um uh wh- while it doesn't say a whole lot specifically about uh uh dryads and hamadryads i think it's a great uh introduction to greek mythology so there you go awesome well that one's definitely been on my list and i yeah i i don't know if i want the audiobook or the printed version maybe yeah. it might be it's a, a tough call might be a double purchase to be honest yeah i have done that before i think you're up oh i am up okay so we are going to move uh from the mediterranean and uh sort of continue on this idea of a little bit like what I, what I was thinking about before, how are how a lot of these myths, the flavor changes, but the relationships kind of are similar, or you know that relationship of uh, humans to to woods continues on. Mm. I will I want to talk about moss maidens and woodwives. Oh my! A lot of my information for this uh, came from my what becoming one of my favorite books on this subject: Spirits, Fairies, Leprechauns, and Goblins, an encyclopedia by Carol Rose. Um, and I really, I kind of want to just, I'm going to actually just read these descriptions because I think they're, they're pretty rich. Um, but these are, these are sort of more, uh, Northern or, or Germanic, uh, folk spirits of the woods, uh, uh, and maybe, uh, up into like Scandinavian as well. Um, so they're similar to nymphs. They tend to be, but like with slightly different, I just think they have more of a Grimm's flavor to them, if that makes sense. So but already talking about like moss and stuff. Yeah. Really feels it, it more, feels like a darker woods, right? Yeah. Yeah. Northern European. Mm-hmm. So these are a type of elf or wood nymph in folklore in Germany. It may also go by, go by the names of forest folk, wild folk, wood folk, or woodwives. They inhabit the forests and are guardian spirits of trees. They're described as tiny little people in the shape of wizened humans. Another sort of idea that we uh, seems to recur. Mm-hmm. Um, usually female. Uh, whose bodies and faces are entirely covered by the mosses that they weave clothes and roots out of the clothes, and they weave clothes uh, out of the roots of trees. Their long hair resemble, resembles gray lichens from the branches, and their unclothed limbs, hands, and feet are like the gnarled roots of the maple tree. They are generally benevolent towards humans and may help with herbal, herbal remedies for the sickness, but w- for for sickness, but will exact revenge for any broken saplings. Their main enemy is the wild huntsman, who we will come back to later on, who pursues the moss folk as his quarry through the woods, through the forests in stormy nights. Um, In Voigtland, this demon, the wild huntsman, is said to be one of the moss folk. So that's uh, the moss maidens. Um, So I also want to cross that with, so what's, I want to, I want to cross that with the description of the woodwives which are uh, feel slightly more Scandinavian. And then I want to talk about like uh, some of the things this puts me in mind of. 
So these are uh, woodwives are diminutive female spirits or elf maidens they, that inhabit the woods in the folklore of Scandinavia and Germany. They're also known as Dirni Weibel, Ellie folk, Finns Weibel, Holzfrau, Moss women, spay wives, wild folk, wish wives. They are described as being pretty with long blonde hair, wearing blue dress, a blue dress with a green bodice and a red jacket. When loud noises and steam issue from rocks in the summer, it is said that the wood wives are washing their clothes. Sometimes they would ask to borrow something from or have something mended by a human who sees them in the woods. And this is the part that gets really, to me, very charming. It is proven to give this, them assistance for although the payment will be in wood chips on leaving the forest, <laughs> on leaving the forest, these will turn to gold. Many mm. kindly woodsmen have accepted these wood shavings without comment and discovered their reward in due course. But the mean minded humans, having thrown away the wood chips, never knew their value. So and so their existence is also never look a wood chip in the mouth. <laughs> right. Or, or always keep them in your pocket, at least till you get out of the woods. <laughs> <laughs> um, and they like, like the dryads are, are, uh, their lives are, are tied to the trees that they, um, that they inhabit. And if the trees are cut down, they cease to exist. Um, finally, there's, uh, there's another, uh, there's sort of a queen of the wood wives, uh, called the, uh, the, the old lady of the elder tree. And she seems very much, um, uh, or the elder queen, and she seems somewhat related to like um, uh, the the like like the fairy queens, right? Um, mm. So, uh, but it's the guardian spirit of the elder elder uh, elder tree. She was removed, revered as belonging to the little people in the folklore of northern Britain, known as the elder mother, elder queen, and old lady of the elder tree. So, um, so she seems to be sort of the the the. The main one, and I'd want to say that the the moss maidens put me in mind of. I don't know if you're familiar with the the book Kristen Lavern's daughter. Mm -mm. Uh, it's this big uh, by Sigrid Unstedt, and it's this sort of ah, um, uh, it's this big Norwegian novel um, that that mostly follows the life of this this woman. Um, um, and I, I will say I, I have a lot of friends who have read this book, but I have not read it myself. But it's one of those books that you feel like you've read um, mm -hmm. because of how many people have talked to you about it. Sure. <laughs> um, and it's there's not there's not like you're following her life uh, like in the Middle Ages. Right. And um, I think it's like like 14th century or something. And she's. And it's not a it's not a fantasy, but. Early in her life, she apparently encounters a wood fairy. Um, and specifically when Anna read this book and described the scene to me, uh, you know, it seems very much like the woodwives, uh, the way it was described, or even as the, uh, the elder mother, um, mm. as, uh, especially the way they're described with the, the, the red jacket and the, the dress and the long blonde hair. And... The other thing it puts me in mind of uh, those, these descriptions is uh, the art of John Bauer. Um, okay. So, and I know you know his stuff. So he does those marvelous trolls. Uh, Scandinavian artist does these marvelous trolls and these sort of ethereal, like elven, blonde-haired, uh, diminutive uh, figures. I know if you look him up, you'll you'll have seen his art before. It's 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 right. It's like super classic uh, fairy tale art, mm -hmm. and the, in the same realm as as Rackham. And yes, he's very yeah. he's very much in that same uh, yeah area uh, as Arthur mm -hmm. Rackham and and even like uh, you know Alan Lee a lot. Now, who is this other character that you mentioned? The Huntsman. Oh, the or? Huntsman. But we're going to come back to the Huntsman. That's actually my okay. third one. Because oh, okay. it gets really, really fun and crazy. Oh, but anyway, good. I'm to excited. wrap this one up, uh, the other thing I found myself thinking of when I was uh, thinking of uh, particularly, particularly the description of the moss maidens, the wizened, lichen encrusted, moss encrusted uh, ones, was Moss Man. <laughs> yes, uh, my and, favorite. <laughs> uh, he of the like as a character, I, I it would be I'd be hard pressed to call Moss Man my favorite. But of the toys, uh huh. Mossman was so weird. It was like a mm -hmm. beast man 
mo- uh, it was the same mold as Beastman, but covered in something I could never put my finger on what it was. Yeah, and, the, it's green flocking, and he smelled like pine trees. Fantastic. Yeah, he smelled like pine trees, and that like just made me just made me remember a Moss Man, how strange that was, and how the He Man toys were um more creative than they had to be (laughs) Uh um like the toys that put smells on their toys stinkor and moss man right it's so weird it's so weird so uh anyway that's i will say i love moss and so this is already putting like moss gardens and like have you ever seen people who actually make lawns out of moss oh yeah that's awesome yeah. Yeah. And Moss yeah. is, yeah, Moss is, Moss is fantastic. And I think that's just the, I think that's another one of those just very obvious mental connections. Oh, a creature, humanoid creature with a cloak of Moss that yeah. just seems, that just fits. It just seems natural. Right. And I almost, you know, could make like a really cool art project, like finding twigs and stuff for, for arms. And yeah. Like a little. Yeah. But just moss is yeah. a moss is a covering for a, a wise and little creature. I guess here's the thing: like wh- something that there's a phrase that kept, keeps coming back to me these days is like uh, G.K. Chesterton has mentioned. Um, uh, he says like mythology is a search. the 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 refrain of mythology is not these things are, but it's why cannot these things be? Mm. And it it makes you think like there are certain things about these these recurring creatures and ideas that are like. Uh, the ideas fit and you you it's almost like it's too right not to exist it's a lot to think about <laughs> so that's my i get very philosophical at the end of moss maidens uh, every episode of moss maidens gets me all philosophical um we might want to make our campfire a little bigger Mm. Um, we might want to just kind of make sure that the tent is easily accessible. I don't know if there's, you know, maybe grab the shovel. Oh, grab the um, shovel. Uh, well, uh, you know, just, ha- or, or a stick or something, okay. or, you know, a stick that you've been, you know, having the marshmallows or the weenies on. <laughs> okay. So I'm going to take you to Southern New Jersey to an area called the Pine Barrens. The Pine Barrens are 1.1 million acres. She million. Creamy. Okay. Acres. Yes. Yeah. Uh, of sandy, nutrient poor, acidic soils that when the early settlers came, uh, they couldn't cultivate it. So that's part of why this area has remained uh, wild. And, 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 you know, Again, it's called the Pine Barrens because it's just like all pine trees. Uh, there's even like carnivorous plants that live there. Th- this is real. This is not. OK, you know, no, I'm, I'm, I'm with you. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so uh, there's also there's owls and there's deer, but there's also another creature. Called the Jersey Devil. Oh, man. So the Jersey Devil is a really gnarly uh, kind of thing. So it's often described as having a horse-like head. Okay. Um, It's bipedal. Uh, It's got goat-like legs. Um, In fact, some people have actually described it as almost looking kangaroo-like. And if you see drawings and sculptures of it, like it's got kind of that same basic shape. And it's also got uh, a long neck and a long forked serpentine tail, red eyes, and huge bat wings. Uh, (laughs) This is crazy. Yeah. So this is, I want to say that I have heard of the Jersey Devil, but I knew nothing Mm -hmm. about it. So this is, and and if you had just asked me to imagine what something called the Jersey Devil would look like, Mm -hmm. this is not it. This is great. Uh, well, you know, same thing. I, I would put myself actually in that same category. Okay. The Jersey Devil is it's it reportedly uh, it is very quick, moves very fast, and is often uh, accompanied by a blood curdling scream. Hmm. Now we're gonna do a little time travel, and I'm gonna take you back 
1735. In 1735, Japet and Deborah Leeds lived in the Pine Barrens with their 12 children. 1735. 1735. Okay. So this is before before the United States even existed as the United States. Yeah. And so they lived in the Pine Barrens. They had 12 children, which is a remarkable amount of children for 1735. Yeah. As she was close to giving birth to their 13th child, Mother Leeds was said to have cursed the baby in frustration, claiming that the baby would be a devil. So the baby was born as all babies are, and it was a normal baby, but then it began to transform. And it turned into this devilish form, and it was said to have beaten the rest of the family with its forked tail before escaping out the chimney into the Pine Barrens. And for the next several hundred years, it was actually known as the Leeds Devil, not as the Jersey Devil. Okay. One of the things I was surprised about is, again, I knew about the Jersey Devil. I knew that it was a cryptid. I thought it was a more or less kind of recent thing. I kept thinking about when you talked about the Chupacabra, and right. there are there are similarities. So, okay. like, the Jersey Devil is is linked to a lot of, like, livestock killing, things mm-hmm. like that. Mm-hmm. Um, and then, you know, I was amazed when you told me that the Chupacabra came about in, like, the 90s. Mm-hmm. Here, it's just the opposite. I thought the Jersey Devil was, again, maybe like the 50s or 60s, because that's where a lot of cryptids seem to come from. But the fact that this goes back to 1735, I mean, like I said, this thing predates the country. Yeah. Throughout that time, uh, again, there have been sightings of the Jersey Devil. So, you know, there aren't really necessarily fairy tales or specific stories or folklore about it, but there are just collections of these sightings. And by 1800, um, sightings in this area had become ubiquitous. Uh, Hundreds of people had claimed to have seen the Jersey Devil, including, this this was amazing to me, Joseph Bonaparte, who, yes, is the brother of that (laughs) Bonaparte. (laughs) Wow. Yeah, uh, apparently Napoleon's older brother had an estate down in in the area and claimed to have seen this creature while he was hunting in about 1820. So then in 1909, there was this huge wave, this huge rash of sightings from people. And like I said, like when you read it, all of these people that had these sightings were deemed to be uh, uh, credible, hmm. which is which is a nice way of saying they weren't drunks or crazy people right or or you know known known tale tellers huh but in 1909 there was such a huge wave and it was so ubiquitous that the philadelphia zoo actually offered a ten thousand dollar reward in 1909 money for anyone who could bring them this this creature and there's actually stories about uh people bringing apparently somebody actually did bring them a kangaroo that they had attached like claws and bat wings to. of course <laughs> um but sightings persist persist to this to this day again of of the jersey devil um there are a lot of explanations you know a lot of the explanations have to do with uh like great horned owls mm-hmm. which which can actually have like a five foot wingspan so they can be quite big um, another one that I really like is there's a bat from Africa called the hammer headed bat. Okay. And if you Google this thing, if you look it up to me, the hammer headed bat looks like the way the Jersey devil is described. It has this unbelievable face, this head that looks kind of like a horse and a hammer, like it's bizarre and they're really large too. And so there's speculation that maybe at that time that there was one that um, had been a transplant or, or something, you know, came over on a ship, you know, who, who knows? And obviously it being native to Africa, you know, people would not know what the hell that was. Sure. Yeah. And, you know, and there are pictures of like hooved uh, footprints on like people's roofs in, in the snow 
things like that. But yeah, again, the 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 real remarkable thing to me was just sort of how how old this legend was and how uh how well known particularly in that area the jersey devil is i mean they got sports teams and stuff right <laughs> um but yeah that's that's the jersey devil and i like the origin of um this this leeds couple so there is you know they're they're in the records and and the number of children that they had and stuff like that so they were definitely real people and what a weird wonderful origin story for this one I like the idea that she just uh, she cursed the baby. Yeah. Like all you have to do is say this baby is going to be a devil, and then yeah. it turns it like, yeah. Th- there are other um, there are other variations again that actually from the start say that she was a witch. Okay. And that sure. Is, oh yeah. You know this. Th- that maybe makes a little more sense in a weird and way. She's, she's in that, prime time uh, witch era. That's true too. Yeah. That's yeah, that's that's cool. And the fact that Napoleon's brother. I also just I love. Yes, it. yes. Napoleon's Joe, brother saw one like Joe Bonaparte. Yeah. Old Joe Bonaparte. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> he's like, he's had enough of trying to take over Europe. He leaves. Yeah. Like, I'm going to America. I want a quiet life. And then he gets wrapped up in some like X-Files nonsense. So I. I'm very excited about my last one. I I don't know if I've saved the best for last, but I've saved one that I really like for last. Uh, well, I'm already intrigued. Yes, and it, we've, we've already alluded. To yes, it. we've alluded to with the moss mains. We alluded to the wild huntsman, and uh, this is another one. Oh, guys, it's kind of big. It's another one that I feel um, is sort of like. Well, even, as I was reading about this, it, it became like. Uh, multicultural in its in, in its appearance of similar uh ideas right mm. so mm-hmm. first of all the idea of the wild hunt um so this is a which i will admit is again something that i have heard of but don't know anything about and we're talking sort of like the anglo-saxon world here right um like yeah germany we, england we are yes we're talking about okay. the, sort of the anglo-saxon world germany yeah exactly uh, all that northern european area there's this idea of the wild hunt and i just i feel like well i'm just gonna uh the wild hunt then it's like so yeah around throughout western europe um but also in other cultures there's this idea of the wild hunt and it's like this uh, generally described as a supernatural host of spirits roaring through the skies on stormy nights um Ooh. you can almost like imagine just with the, that sentence, like night on like, bald mountain from Fantasia. Yes, you've got it in your mind. It's like it, it pre, it's pre-existing in your mind almost uh, through osmosis. Um, yeah, and they're they're looking for souls of the damned, or the unbaptized, or just onlookers to seize them and can, to convey them to hell. Um, mm. It could be a host of the undead, uh, or or spirits, or goats, or horses. It just it's endlessly varied, which is which is really strange and interesting. But you get like this sense of the wild hunt passing through the trees. Um, lo- it could be like huge black and to hide. Yes, yes, because you- and there's always like there's a horn involved. You can hear it coming. In England, the wild hunt is known generally as the furious host, hurls raid, the raging host, or Woden's hunt. So now we're getting mm. back into um, Odin and, and North myths, Norse myths. The various English. I don't imagine Odin cares if people are baptized or not. <laughs> no, see, th- like there's a like some of this is is a Christianization, but it's definitely older than that. So in some versions, okay, so there are various English regional names for the hunt are Arthur's Hunt in Somerset, Dando and his dogs, the Devil's Dandy Dogs of Car- of Cornwall, Gabriel's Hounds, Gabble Wretchets. Gabriel Rechets. Um, uh, let's see. It's like it's like there's endless like um, different names for this. Mm. So although the wild hunt is an entity that seems to be confined to the folklore of Western Europe, there are other spirits with many similar features throughout the world. And we will talk soon about um, the Hantu Siburu of West Malaysia. But mm. let's think of like I want to. But what's interesting to me is the character. So we've got the wild hunt, but the wild huntsman himself is this interesting character. So he's ge- the, this is a general term for the leader of the wild hunt. But what's interesting is 
to me is that there are all these different identities. Like the the, the wild huntsman seems to be just whoever is leading the wild hunt, but it could be mm. different people. Okay. Meaning, um, so here here's a list of some of them. Uh, it could be a demonized cultural hero like King Arthur, a spirit huntsman, the grand. Wait, 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 wait. No, it, like, look, wait, 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 it wait, can wait. be King Arthur. It can be Odin. It can be the devil himself. A demonic King Arthur. Yeah, demonic King Arthur, like a like dark Arthur, like Bizarro Arthur. Yeah, yeah. Um, okay. Uh, so, and sometimes they're looking for like spirits, but as we said earlier, sometimes they're trying to hunt down the moss women. Mm-hmm. And then, uh, so, okay, here's, here's some of the names of this thing. So Black Vaughn, a damned human. These are some of the, the, the characters who have been mentioned in stories as, as the wild huntsman. Dando, a damned human. The devil. Uh, Grim. Oh, Dewar Grim. Uh, Harry Knab. Hearn the Hunter, who we'll talk about. That I've heard of, yes. Yes, Hearn the Hunter, we're gonna we're gonna talk about because there's a um well I'll get to Hearn the Hunter. King Arthur, King Hurler, Sir Francis Drake, uh <laughs> Wild Darnell, Wild Edric. <laughs> Wild Darnell sounds like it's great. He's like a guy that hangs out at the bowling alley or something. Oh yeah, that's, <laughs> that's Wild Darnell. Wild Darnell. So okay, in, in France it could be King, uh R2, who's another version of King Arthur. Cain from the Bible. So oh. actual Cain, uh, King Herod- Herodias, Charlemagne. Um, gosh, there's so many of these. I'm, I'm skipping over some of them because some of them I just don't even make any sense. Hokel Bro- Block in, oh, I can't even. So Odin is, is another one that comes up a lot. And, um, so, okay, this just goes on and on. There are so many um, versions of the wild huntsman. Mm. Um, and, and that alone is interesting to me and, and people have like done stuff with this. I really like, uh, in the Dresden files, um, he, the wild hunt comes up and, you know, I like the Dresden files. Um, Mm. and in that, I don't, uh, listeners, this could potentially be a spoiler. Um, but there, uh, one of the characters that comes up in the Dresden files is the Kringle, who is a, a Northern, like, type of spirit who sometimes puts on the the mantle of uh santa claus and sometimes takes up the wild hunt Mm. the kringle the kringle and but as i was reading this i came across um the hantu which are um is a seems to be seems to be a general term for uh spirit or um fairy creature in uh west malaysia the Hantu may also be referred to as, this was interesting to me, as Shaitan, a word from which the Christian Satan is derived. Okay, so of, there's all these different kind of Hantu, and, and they some of them are very similar to dryads in that they are spirits associated with specific trees. Um, so they're um, the, the, the Garu, or the aloe tree has, a, has its own Hantu, uh, stuff like this. So they seem similar to actually more similar to dryads than, than something like woodwives because of the specific ones being allocated to specific trees. But then there's the Hantu Siburu, which is the name of a spirit in folk beliefs of, of, the, of West Malaysia. Spirit of the hunt. It's a demon hunter who roams the jungle with his pack of hounds at the time of the full moon. It is said that the call of the brick brick bird warns that Hantu Siburu is coming. It is faithful for any human to see him, for Hantu Siburu is the portent of sickness and death. You can make offerings and um, prop- propitiation, like like uh, as as you often can. Um, but Hantu Siburu was once a man whose pregnant wife craved the meat of a of a mouse deer in calf in calf to guarantee the birth of a son. Her husband was eager to hunt for the meat and vowed that he would return not return without it. But having misheard his wife, he set out to kill a big buck with with calf. His child was born, but still the father pursued his impossible chase, sending his dogs into the sky and swiveling his neck to search in all directions, thus gradually becoming the demon hunter for all eternity. Finally, uh, related to this, uh, so we mentioned Hearn the Hunter. And yes. so we're going to circle all the way back around. So Hearn the Hunter is one of the versions of the Wild Huntsman. 
and we can circle all the way around. It's very similar to the Wild Huntsman, um, but kind of tied to Windsor, described as like billowing cloak over deerskin garments with a head covered by a skull and the big uh, another thing of the wild huntsman is this helmet with the big antlers which is similar to in the black cauldron right Mm -hmm. so uh yeah this helmet with the antlers Mm. but what i found when i was reading about Hearn the hunter is that things about the wild hunt do come back around to at least as as recently as the 60s that's the 1960s so you know okay not that long ago so a folklorist uh tells this story of 1964 when three youths dressed in the teddy boy style of the 60s i don't know what that is <laughs> i i've heard do of you it. okay I, I, I don't know what i have heard of teddy it, yeah, boy I, style I, of the I'm, 60s is but it imagine i imagine i will be dressed in that way pretty soon uh, it's it's i think it's a british like a mod okay yeah <laughs> okay uh they the band on taking a night of wanton vandalism were breaking a saplings again damaging trees in the great oh wow park. sorry i just yeah i just googled teddy boy look oh. and if you don't do your hair like this i'm gonna be really upset okay i have not googled it yet but i am going to google it and i promise to do my hair like that from now on <laughs> whatever it turns out to be uh you heard it here folks <laughs> So they're going to do all this vandalism and they were going to break saplings in the park. And then one found an old hunting horn in the leaves thinking it was a recent thinking that a recent film crew had left it there by mistake. He picked it up and gave a blast on it. And the other two could not remember seeing a film crew and having second thoughts about being there started to run. The blast had invoked the baying of hounds and the youth now feeling rather strange. That's in quotes called to the others as he staggered after them toward the old chapel. By now they could hear the padding of feet and the soft earth and the breathing of the hounds pursuing them. As the staggering youth reached the chapel door, there was a sound like a whistling arrow through the air. And though the others saw nothing behind him, the lad screamed and fell. And when they reached him, they could see that he was dead with no apparent cause. And the forest was totally silent once more. Mm. So there you go. Uh, the Wild Huntsman is uh, definitely a portent of at least uh, grave peril. But also so wild and awesome. I just love it. Yeah. It, it and it's it's strange to me that so many figures can be put in for the huntsman and figures that aren't traditionally thought of as demonic, like right. Arthur and Charlemagne. Right. And, you right. know. So is it like dark versions or is it sort of like anybody that you want to disparage, you can yeah, I get just there. I just get the yeah, possibly I just also get the impression that if you get this wild antlered helmet, you you're it. You can lead the wild hunt. Ooh, what an awesome idea that is. Yeah. I mean, that's that it like takes over. Yeah, it just you become the wild huntsman for as long as the wild hunt is going on and then maybe you pass the helmet on to somebody else. I just it's great. I, that's and that's I think that I think that keys into what I'm enjoying about the whole idea. Wow, so that was that was our camping trip and <laughs> hopefully we don't hear any hunting horns or uh encounter any puckwudgies or anything like that. But now, okay, so which was your favorite? Which was my favorite? I was thinking about that as we were talking. Um there's two okay. I, I love all three of yours for different reasons. So this is maybe the toughest time I've had of, of, of choosing one of these. Well, you have to pick one. I know. I know. Just um, one. <laughs> I love. So, okay, so I love the Sasquatch just because. Um, because I think be, because I love it, but I think because it's dear to you. Uh, I <laughs> the Jersey Devil is intensely interesting. And I'm very close to choosing it as my favorite, but I, since I'm mentioning it, you know I'm not. But it's something that because of the that history, the 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 dual tie-in of its origin story and uh, uh, Elder Napoleon or Elder Bonaparte uh, <laughs> being kind of tied into it. Which one did Theodore Roosevelt see? He saw the Sasquatch. He he he, he recorded a story. A recorded a story of the Sasquatch. See. Ugh. 
this is so difficult because he knew a guy yeah. that saw a Sasquatch. And that 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 put me immediately in mind of like a whole like the missed opportunity because there was the movie uh, Abraham Lincoln Vampire Hunter, right? Mm. Why couldn't we just go through all the presidents and and you know like like Th- Theodore Roosevelt and the Great Hunt? Theodore Roosevelt in the wild. I've already got the final scene of that movie, and it's where Teddy Roosevelt has the Sasquatch in his sights, right? Yeah. And then, like, the Sasquatch turns and he sees how human the Sasquatch's eyes are. And then he just lowers his rifle, and a tear (laughs) rolls down his cheek into his big, bushy mustache. (laughs) That's really good. It's also. And he lets the Sasquatch go. And then the rest of his Rough Riders come in, and they're like, (laughs) What happened? Like he came in here, get him. And Teddy Roosevelt's like, "No, he he got away. Come on, let's go." Or can I can I plus it? Yeah. He has in his sights all of that happens and then they he communes with the Sasquatch instead and they have a moment mm. together. And then he hears the rough riders coming and the Sasquatch yeah. won't leave. And he starts Get to, out of here. He's like, "We don't got to get out of here." He's like, "I don't love you anymore." So it's the end of Harry and the Hendersons. Yes, and then the Rough Riders come. And that's that's our sequel to Abraham Lincoln, Vampire Hunter. Uh, Jersey Devil is is interesting because of all of these, that's the one that I would like to take a trip and like, like, you know, like a little another monster hunting trip and try to unravel. Like that seems, I'm not going to say attainable, but like visiting the, the site of the Chupacabra sightings, right? Like right, this or the like, Flatwoods Monster. Yeah, this yeah. seems like one I'm sure there's all that stuff. We could visit and try to figure out, you know, so there's that. But um, I just, I, I really like local legend Puckwudgie. Really? I do, yeah. Wow, okay. All right, that surprises me a little bit. Yeah. But that's cool, that's cool. My favorite, uh, I mean, I'm kind of in the same boat where I I liked all of yours. I found the complexity of the dryads to be both educational and fascinating. Um, Obviously the wild hunt, it it was really great. And, you know, it's like, I, I, almost like echoes of like the headless horseman and, you know, and I just, I love this idea of like, you know, an Ichabod crane type character trudging through, you know, the, the, the woods and hearing the horn and, and, you know, becoming terrified that they're coming for his soul. I mean, well, it's, it's like ghost riders in the sky, right? Like that, you know, that song, um, that's like a cowboy version of the wild hunt, isn't it? Hmm. Huh. Yeah. Yeah. Totally. Riders in the sky. Um, <laughs> yeah, that's true. But that said, I, I don't know. The moss women are really cool. Yeah. I mean, I think like visually, I just got such a strong hit uh, of of what those would look like, I think. Um, but you know what? I am going to go with the wild hunt, I think. OK, OK, that's good. I'm going to go with the wild. The wild hunt is pretty broad. Also, it sounds like. And I love that you tied it in with, you know, again, a similar concept from a separate culture. Yeah, is is really interesting. Wow. It's a good one. Lots. Well, we did a lot. We did. We did. And I think it's time to unroll the sleeping bags and maybe try to oh. see if we can get some sleep. Well, I don't know. I've had a lot of sugar with all the s'mores and everything. but I told you but I, not to well, have more than eight, uh, but then you had nine, yeah. ten. I don't know. I didn't count, but I'm, I'm very tired anyway. So yes, I'll see you next time. All right. Well, until next time, for Ben Hatke, I'm Zach Giolongo. And for Zach Giolongo, I am as ever Benjamin Margaret Hatke. Ah, oh, wait, I am for for Benjamin Margaret Hatke. I'm as ever Zach Giolongo. Did I get that right? Mm-hmm. I don't think so. Okay, well, I'll try again next time. <laughs> bye bye. <laughs> All right, bye guys. Hey everyone, David Universe here, producer and audio engineer for Ben and Zach's Monster Market. On behalf of the team, thanks for listening. Music for this episode was created by Twinstrumental. 
If you'd like to see sketches of the creatures discussed on this episode, as well as other mystical goodness, please visit us at monstermarketpod.com, as well as Instagram and Facebook at monstermarketpod. For creature recommendations, or just to say hello, please email us at monstermarketpodcast at gmail.com. And don't forget, subscribe on your favorite podcast platform. Until next time, beware, because they be monsters out there. <laughs>